Thank you so much for clicking on today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. Here at Elm Grove Baptist, our mission is the Great Commission, sharing the gospel and love of Jesus Christ with not only our surrounding community, but across this world. We're so thankful for the opportunity to present these messages online, and as we progress and move forward in our presentation, we ask that you continue to like and subscribe to these videos, and don't forget to share them with your friends and loved ones. Now, please enjoy today's message from Elm Grove Baptist Church. So the song that I'm going to sing tonight is basically the chapter Psalm 91. And I think it means so much, not just for the season we are coming out of, but even the season we're entering. And I hope that you'll be blessed. of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty I will say of the Lord He is my refuge and my fortress my God in Him will I trust He that dwelleth in the sea place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Surely He shall snare of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust he that dwelleth in the sea place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. His truth shall be shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. destruction that wasteth at noonday. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my
shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and Adam. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me. Therefore will I deliver. Grab your Bible with me. Go to 1 Kings chapter 11. First Kings, I lied to you, chapter 21, keeping you on your toes. First Kings 21, not 11, 21, sorry guys. I'm still blown away by the fact that I got licensed this morning. Never in a million years would I think that uh, I'd be doing this. I'm so grateful for it. 1 Kings 11. Let's dive into this tonight. It says, and it came to pass after these things. 21. I keep saying 11. I'm so sorry, James. You're like, what are you doing? Maybe I'm supposed to preach 1 Kings 11. <laughs> Not going to. 1 Kings 21. Maybe because today's the 11th. That's what it is. If you believe that. <laughs> Good. 1 Kings 21, verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake to Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it. For if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers, Unto thee. Let's pray and we'll get into this tonight. Lord, I'm so grateful again just to be in your house, Lord. I love coming to church. Lord, I love just opening up your word. I never 
in a million years would have thought that I would be able and uh, have the opportunity to preach it. Lord, I'm so grateful for uh, every blessing that you give me. Lord, I'm grateful for a church family and a pastor that saw fit to license me to preach the gospel. Lord, just be with this message tonight. I pray you just empty me of myself. Forgive me where I fail thee, as I do often. Lord, I pray you just speak to hearts tonight. Pour out your spirit now in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Kings 21 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. You know, it's interesting in Scripture, when we approach King Ahab, we can view him as a picture of a, of a Satan, right? Oftentimes there are uh, 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 people who uh, uh, God writes about as a clear uh, uh, imagery that we could say, man, this is not a good guy. This man wants nothing of a godly environment, a godly country. He doesn't care about the man of God. He doesn't care about the people of God. He could care less what God is doing. And this is the man that we're talking about, King Ahab. And Ahab spake to Naboth in verse 2, saying, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs. You know, tonight I, I really want to look uh, at this portion of scripture, and you may have heard sermons preached from this, but really I, I want us to think about this in a modern day setting, in a modern day uh, a Christian life, and I really want us to focus on what Ahab, we could say what uh, uh, Satan is really trying to do to us. Here we know, understand that this man Naboth, he has a vineyard, and we understand from verse number three that it was an inheritance of his father. This was something that was handed down from the previous generation, probably from the previous generation before that. This was his family's vineyard. And here Ahab decided one day as he was walking by and he saw this vineyard and he spake to Naboth saying, give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs. You know, as I, I think about our society today, there's so many things, so many uh, attempts, especially in the Christian's life, for somebody to walk by and they want to take a little bit of what we stand for. Maybe a little bit of what we grew up with. Maybe a little bit of that inheritance, so to speak, coming from the previous generation. Coming from those things that my dad taught me, that his dad taught him, that he was taught from his dad. And my great-great-grandpa would roll over in his grave if he knew that I would even consider giving up, in Naboth's case, the vineyard that was left to him. We could say that stand on, on sound doctrine, on the Bible. We, we, we could say uh, that stand on church attendance, that stand on godly music, that stand on godly living, on, on godly uh, uh, lifestyle, that stand on uh, staying away from the things that are in this world because we know that we're not supposed to not love the things that are in this world. And here we can see in verse number two kind of some areas, kind of some ways that things are beginning to try to be pried away from us. He had spake to Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. I heard a preacher say once, herbs. And he's talking about this specific pastor. He said, Never once did I come home after a hard day's work, and I asked my wife, Hey, honey, would you go into the kitchen and make me a pepper sandwich? It doesn't happen. As much as I love pepper, I want some meat to it. Uh, I want it to have some substance. I, I want it to be the real thing. I, I want that sandwich to be big and my mouth to barely fit around it. Megan thinks I got a very large mouth. And, and I, I want that sandwich to be everything that I expected after a hard day's work. And now, all of a sudden, he's saying, listen, you give me your vineyard and I'll just, I'll give you, or I want to use it for a garden of herbs. Just, just a little taste of what is real. Hey, hey, modern day church, come on, we'll come in and, and, and we'll have a church building and, and, and we'll have a man who gets up in his, in his little polo shirt and sits on the stool and says, I just want to talk to you tonight. Okay, and, and, and he's going to be all smiles and he's going to tell you everything that's good in your life and how you can have a better life. And he's going to tell you everything just tickling your ears. 
And he's going to keep spewing things and spewing things, but then maybe every now and then he'll sprinkle a little bit of truth in there. Just to give you a taste of the truth. Just to give you a little bit of what's real so you can leave there saying, I was, I was in church today. Man, God really spoke to me today. Because that little bit of truth, that, that, that's enough to make us feel good. That, that's enough to make us feel happy about things. You know, it's interesting, we can get into a home situation and, and, and we can see our children coming home from schools and, and our children coming home and, and we look at what they're being taught. I was blown away not too long ago by the state of Oregon. Okay, and here, all of a sudden, across the entire state, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, I know I told the teenagers because I did a lesson on truth. And I said, guys, and I wrote on the board, two plus two equals five. They said, What? I said, well, that's my truth. I said, well, that's what I believe. And Brother Chuck, I think I might have mentioned this to you. I said, the entire state of Oregon decided that they were going to send their teachers to a training uh, one day, some kind of uh, specialty training, so they can get out the, the white supremacy in math. And, and, and I, I was trying to wrap my mind around how exactly... This was, and I began to read this article, and it was pointing out some of the highlighted areas in this training packet, and basically it was coming down to the fact that, listen, there, 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 there's so much racial tension and so much white supremacy, and there's so many issues in math because there's a, a right, and we're telling children that there's a wrong answer. I said, there is a wrong answer. And I look at my son, I say, there is a wrong answer. And you better get it right. We need to understand there is truth in today. And, and they're trying to come along. And, and society and, and we could say uh, the powers of the air and Satan and his minions. They're trying to take away everything that we hold dear. And just give us just enough truth to where we don't actually fight back for it. To where we can stand back and we say, well, it's not a big deal. It's going to be fine. My son's going to be uh, fine going to that school. And he's going to learn from those teachers. But you know what? He's going to come home and I'm going to teach him what's right. But then he's going to go to school and he's going to learn what's wrong. And then he's going to come home and I'm going to try to teach him what's right. And he's going to go to school and, and it's back and forth and back and forth. You know, he wanted that garden just for herbs. He's trying to give the imitation. Of the real deal. You know, he continued on though. He said, Give me thy vineyard that I may have it for a garden of herbs. And not only that, he said, Well, because it's near into my house. Because it's near into my house. You know, they're trying to come in and they're trying to, especially this next generation that's coming up. Okay, you, you can see uh, the, the massive amount of teenagers here tonight. Okay, and I'm proud of him for coming. He's faithful. And we do have a classroom full of ladies across the way who are, are going through their Bible study right now. But there could be more. But what he hears and what they hear all week, maybe some of their friends go to different churches. And we have teenagers who have friends who go to different churches. And they have these friends who go to different churches. Well, they're going to go to church with their friend on Sunday. Well, their church only has Sunday morning. And it's not a Sunday school on a Sunday morning. It's just a Sunday morning. And the adults will meet in here and they'll have their worship service. But the teenagers will meet over here and they're going to have their worship service. And it's going to be amazing. And they keep being bombarded with these decisions it's easy. I used to pull that on my dad. Pull that on my dad. I say, Dad, I'm going to go to church with my friends this week. Are you going to church? I'm going to church, I promise. They believe the Bible. They believe the Bible. And it was just that seasoning. It was just that sprinkling. But he continued on, right? And, and what I was getting at, says that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it's near to my house. You know what? It's just convenient for me. <laughs> this is convenient for me. Man, they have that one morning service. I don't have to go back Sunday night. I don't have to listen to that Brother Daniel guy. 
Man, I, I, I could not worry about Sunday school. I could just go for Sunday morning, and that guy, he's only going to give me a little bit of truth, so I'm not going to feel convicted about it on my way home. But I'll feel good about it because I was in church. And it's just a little bit, just a taste of the real thing, and it's so convenient for me. And churches all across the station, pastor could tell you some, I could tell you stories hearing about churches, and they're saying, listen, uh, we'll, we'll cut out Sunday nights, just come, just come. We'll cut out Wednesday nights, just come, just come. We'll move to a different type of setting, just come, whatever's convenient for you. I'm still searching for the verse, pastor. Because it's convenient for you to do this. Please do it. I haven't found it yet. I, I haven't found it. You know what? It's interesting because the convenience factor goes across everything. Well, I, I like to read this other type of Bible because it's, it's just, it's convenient for me. It's easier. I don't understand why, why we have to, to use that old Bible. That's an entire sermon. Maybe a couple weeks but there is a reason, and I've studied it out. If you use a different Bible, keep coming. But if you use a different Bible, one day you'll realize yours is wrong. I always tell the teenagers, things that are not the same are different. Things that are different are not the same. I don't even know what I tell them. <laughs> things that are different are not the same. There's a reason that I use this Bible. There is a reason, not because it's convenient to me, not because it's easy for me, but because I know it's truth. Because I've seen it proven throughout the years. I understand what its purpose is. I understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That this book, the King James Bible, is profitable for me, for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. Why? That I can be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That that's what it's for. All scripture is given by inspiration, not because it's convenient for me, but because it's beneficial for me. I don't go to church because it's convenient for me. I come to church because it's beneficial for me. God has a purpose for the church in your life. And it's not because it's easy and you're going to feel nice and fluffy and pretty when you leave here. It's because it has a purpose and it's good for you. There is a benefit for it. He says, it's near my house. It's wonderful. I can just open up my, my front door and get there. I, I, I don't go to that church because it's too far away. One of the reasons we were so encouraged by this church before we ever moved here was because Grandma, she said, we decided 25 mile radius from our house. And she said, we just started spiraling out. And this one was 24.8 or something like that. 24.8. I said, so that's the church. She said, that's the church we go to. Yeah. You know why? It wasn't convenient. It wasn't right down the street. There was a Baptist church right down the street from her. Quivira Baptist. Me and Steve just met somebody who used to go there the other day. We got some lumber from him the other day. And he says, listen, it's not because it's convenient. It's not because it's easy. Too many Christians, too many people who have grown up in churches, who understand the truth of God's word, who listen to a pastor who's been preaching for 47 years, and they're giving up for the easy way out. You know what's easy? Cheating on tests. Hey, you know what's easy? Cheating in sports. Hey, you know what's easy? Cheating on your taxes. Hey, hey, you know what's easy? And we can go on and there's so many things. It's just easier. It's easier to just put a candy bar in my pocket than pay for it at the register. And society is telling you things and, and, and they're trying to get this mindset into your heads, into your children's heads that, listen, it, it's easier to not go to church. It's easier to not live for God. It's easier to do whatever the world wants you to do than have that tension between you and your friends, you and your teachers, you and your future employers. It's easier this way. But it continues on because it's near to my house. He says, here's what I'll do for you, Naboth. 
I will give it thee for it a better vineyard than it. Hey, hey, hey I'm going to give you a better vineyard, Naboth. I know this is the one. I'm, I'm going to do it better for you. The bigger and better mentality. Right? You need this bigger. You, you need a, it's better if you get the biggie gulp. It's only 20 cents more. It's better if you supersize it. It's only 30 cents more. It, it's better this way. We could put it this way. Hey, the grass is greener on the other side. I, I, I know you like what you got, but think of the possibilities. One of my wife's favorite movies is The Preacher's Wife. You ever seen this older movie, Denzel Washington? She didn't like me watching it with her because I'm like, Dad, this is a horrible pastor's wife. What is her issue? She's complaining all the time, flirting with angels. Come on. She's like, you ruined that movie. <laughs> <laughs> but in that movie, this big name guy, he comes in and he says, look at what I'm going to do for you. He says, I'm going to build you this brand new church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you all. The, there's going to be a senior citizen center. There's going to be a youth center. I don't know what all was in there, but we can, we can play with it. There's going to be an Olympic-sized swimming pool. There's going to be basketball courts, roller skating rings. Anything you think, the church is going to be on fire. Think of them. But we want your field. We want your spot. They were trying to turn in that, that whole area of the neighborhood into some kind of, uh, 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 um, I don't know, super center or whatever it was. My wife will watch this and correct me later. <laughs> and, and they're trying to turn in whatever they had into something that it wasn't ever meant to be. We can do it better. We can give you something better. You know, I, I always thought that was kind of interesting. Whether it's scripture version here with Naboth and Ahab or it's in your own life when somebody offered that. If it's so much better, why didn't they take it? If there's such a better vineyard for Naboth to take, why didn't King Ahab want the better one? That doesn't make any sense to me. Why? Because they're trying to get in. They're trying to, to work their way into your life to where they push you out of where you're supposed to be under the, the preface, under, under this blanket of this is going to be better for you. It's going to be better if you get rid of that old music. It's going to be better if you get rid of the old Bible. It's going to be better if you get rid of that, that nasty tie around your neck. It's going to be better if you get away from the old paths. If it's so much better, why are you failing? Why do I see you struggling? Why are there no real sound decisions? Why are there no real commitments made in your church? Why, why are those teen groups uh, falling apart? Why are those teen groups, and I, and I look at the teens that come every now and then from these other churches, and I say, there, there's, there's, they don't care about church. They don't care about God. If that's really such a better way to go, prove it to me. Prove it to me. I often will say this, and you've probably heard me say it. I always tell people, this is the way it is. And they say, oh, Brother Daniel, you just think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Yes. It sounds mean, but it's not. You just think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Yes, because if I thought something else could be right, I wouldn't be what I am. I, I wouldn't be taking this stand. I wouldn't be fighting for what's right. I wouldn't be preaching to these young people and saying, listen, you got to choose right now. Figure it out for yourself. He says, I could give you something better. Or, he says, if it seemed good to thee, I'll give thee the worth of it in money. Ah, money. I'll, I'll give you the worth of it in money. Hey, hey, church member who you used to be faithful to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, now all of a sudden you've got a job. All of our teenagers are trying to get jobs right now, it seems like. And I will pray for them gladly to get a job. I often will tell them that. 
I said, I will pray for you that you get that job as long as it doesn't take you out of church. I was like, in the second it takes you out of church, I will pray that you lose that job as quick as you got it. And they look at you like, what? It's like, why in the world would I promote something that takes you away from what I know is truth? Well, what I know is going to help you grow and help you succeed in life. Money doesn't solve all the issues. All it does is put a label on you that says, I'm a sellout. Well, I, I used to be faithful and really I was on fire in attendance, but I got this better job out of state and, and I knew I just needed to take that job for my family. Do they have a church nearby that you've already looked into? Are you planning on attending there? Well, we haven't looked for a church yet, Brother Daniel. Why not? I, th I thought God was important to you. Well, he is, he is, but, but I'm going to get established and really uh, get, get some roots planted in this job first. What's the point? You could get out there and, and, and it could be gone just like that. My brother-in-law came and lived with us for a short while in Phoenix. It's Megan's youngest brother. And he came out and he was just trying to get back on his feet. So he slept on our couch for a while, and I helped him fix his truck he was having issues with. And one day he comes to me and he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to move back to, I think it was Wisconsin. I'm going to move back to Wisconsin. I was like, well, have you thought about it? He said, well, you, you know, uh, there, there's a job up there. My cousin says that he could, he could get it for me. And I was like, are you sure? Well, yeah, he's pretty sure that he can get me this job, and it's, I'm going to make really good money. I was like, are you going to be going to church? Well, yeah, you know, he says he has a church that he might go to every now and then. I was like, have you talked to the pastor yet? I was just the assistant pastor. He said, well, no, I haven't talked to him. I was like, hey, there's, a, there's wisdom in the counsel of many. I was like, hey, hey, you need to slow down a little bit. Don't just jump to this decision. And within 24 hours, he says, you know what? No, I'm going. I said, listen, before you leave tonight, I was like, let me take you out to dinner. And I, and I pulled open the Bible and I gave him verses and verses and said, listen, you need to be patient. You need to just wait. You need to trust. You need to understand. No rash decision making. You, you need to slow down and understand money is not going to answer everything. We got home. He says, I appreciate your time. And and everything that you, you've done for me, but I'm going to I'm going to go. I'm going to move. I was like, why don't you sleep the night? He says, no, nah, I'm going to go tonight. I said, buddy, it's 9 o'clock at night. No, it's okay. I can drive through. I, I was in the military. I'm fine. So he heads out, and me and Megan are scratching our heads saying, oh, watch over. Next thing you know, we get a call from his brother, my other brother-in-law, I think it was, that called us, and he was in the hospital. He had fell, fallen asleep at the wheel and rolled his truck about six, seven times, I think it was, and slammed through one of the freeway signs. And He came to. Everything's fine. He's married, kids. No issues, but he looks back at that and says, all for a little bit of money. He is his offer for just a little bit of what I thought was better, what I considered to be best, what somebody else was trying to offer me. And verse number three says, Nabal said to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. You know, in Isaiah 5, verse number 20 says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What's he saying? It's like, hey, hey, be careful when you start mixing up what you know to be right for what's wrong. God's still got an opinion on the matter. He, he, he still has the answers for what you're dealing with. He, he still knows that decision that you're thinking about making. I'm going to give you the worth of it in money. Hey, I'm going to give you a better vineyard. Hey, this is just so convenient for me. 
Hey, I, I just want to do it for just a little taste, something, something a little seasoning, something a little salty. I just, I just want this in my life right now. You know what? We, we need to have a generation right now that's going to be standing up and we're going to be saying, it's not for sale. Hey, 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 just like Naboth did, the Lord forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my father's unseen. This isn't for sale. What are the issues that are slipping right now from you? Think of the churches. Look around tonight. Is it church attendance? Maybe. Hey, is it your Bible reading? Is it that old pastor? Is it that weird young pastor? <laughs> hey, well, what is it that, that, that's, that's driving you the other direction? Maybe it's some friends at work. Maybe it's those friends at school. Maybe whatever it is, that family member. And they're saying, listen, I, I, I just think this is going to be better for you. There comes a point when we have to say it's not up for sale. In Ezekiel 22 verses 29 through 30 says the people of the land have used oppression have exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy yea they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully he says and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it and some of the saddest words in all scripture but I found none Man, this was the passage that I was called to the ministry from. This, this verse right here, I sought for a man among them. Listen, Christ is calling out to a local church. You are here for a reason. You've heard me say that numerous times. Every time I get up to preach just about. You're in this church on purpose. For a reason. A specific need that God has for you here. It's not out there. there. There's not a better way for you to do things. I understand God moves people at times, but he's put you here for this season for you to serve him, for his glory, for your benefit. And he said, man, I want for you to do these things. Listen, society's coming and they're, they're telling our kids, hey, Miss Cheris, you teach those kids the right way. You know, by the, eight, by the time they're in sixth grade, kids already know what they're going to believe in regards to God. And things of religion. Before I ever get them, Miss Cheris. And then I get them and I got to try to pound them for the next five, six years. Saying, listen, this is the right way. This is the right path. Stay on the old path. Stay on the straight and narrow. And they say, I've already decided. They don't say it to me, but just the way they present themselves. They've sold a few things along the way. They, they, they've given up a little bit of land. You know, I just thought of this uh, in 1 Samuel. Turn there with me. 1 Samuel. Let me see if I can find it here. I'm not going to find it in time. 1 Samuel. We're going through, and, and he's, he's listing out some of his mighty men. And, and as he's going down the list, he says, man, there's this one guy, and he took out uh, 800 men with a spear in one battle. Hey, man, I got this other guy. He's a mighty man. He was so worked up in this battle that his hand was cleaved to his sword, and we had to pry his fingers off because he was not willing to budge. My man, I got this guy. His name's Shama. And there was this time that the, the Philistines were coming into this, this area of uh, Israel and they were coming onto these crops. And there was this field of lentils and in Chronicles it says there was barley there also. And it says they were coming onto this field of lentils. And he said, you know what? I'm sick of this. You're not taking this land. I'm not budging on this. You're not getting this. And he, he wiped them out and he saved that parcel of land. You know, back then the Philistines used to, they were dirty, rotten scumbags, right? They, they would come in and they would wait they would just wait until the crops were fully grown. They wouldn't grow them themselves, but they'd come in and they'd take yours. Maybe they'd kill you off and just, just take all of your harvest and then wait for the next season and find some other prey. 
Man, they would come in and they'd wait for your, your business to be a closing day. And they'd say, hey, I'll take all that money that you made today. And, and they would just come in and devastate the children of Israel. Well, at this point, uh, the children of Israel obviously weren't doing too good. David and his mighty men, they were kind of the outcasts. They were the, the run-down guys. They were out in the wilderness. And Shammah, maybe he was in a position, he's saying, man, if I don't protect this, my family's not eating tonight. Man, if I don't take a stand, my family is going to be destroyed. If I don't take a stand, we could say modern terms, my church is going to be destroyed. I, I forget the number of churches that close every day, but it's not, it's not a good thing. As I mentioned this morning, pastors are only staying for four years at best. Man, man, man and we need some people to be willing to stand just like Shaman. He got up and he said, listen, this land you're not getting. Maybe we should take a stand and say, you know, my worship to God, you're not going to take from me. Daniel took a stand. He said, my prayer life to God, you're not going to take from me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, listen, the way that I serve my God, you're not going to take from me. Maybe we need some families that are willing to say, you know what, my children, you're not going to take them away from me. Before we moved here, we were walking through a Target trying to find a birthday gift for one of our in-betweener group uh, members. We started a group at our last church called the in-betweeners. It was anybody out of high school but younger than our pastor. They were in between. And we'd get together and we'd play games and we'd goof off. And one of them had a birthday and we were going through and Micah was just a little guy sitting in the cart and he's blah, 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 trying to learn how to talk. And he looks over and he just points at this card. He can't read, thankfully. But man, the card, I mean, just plain as day. Cuss words right on the front of it. And I look at Megan and I said, what in the world? I was like, our son's going to start to learn to read. And just from walking through the card aisle, he's going to come home and say, what does this word mean? Or we're going to be driving down the road and all of a sudden from the back seat, he's going to spl <laughs> just share it with us. I said, what in the world is this world coming to? That was four years ago. Look at where we are now. Look at the issues that we're facing as a society here in a Christian land. Yeah. We've given up some land. We've given up some ground. We need some people who are gonna, who are gonna stand up and are gonna say, listen, it's not for sale. L listen, th th this Church, this community, these people, my family, my career, my life, it's not for sale. It's not for sale. You know, I get up and, and you might see me preaching. And the teenagers see me preaching. But when I go home, I have a wife. And I have a family. And I have a dad who's going to be watching this. And maybe he's praying for me tonight. And I have a mom who's going to watch this. And maybe she's praying for me. And a stepmom who's probably going to watch this is probably praying for me. Maybe a grandma. And they're looking at me, and I would hate for one day for them to say, what happened? Remember when you used to go to church? Remember when you used to serve God? Remember when you used to be excited about opening up the Bible? Remember when you used to be excited to pray? Remember when you used to be excited? What happened? When did you sell out? When did you think there was a better way of doing things? Hey, when, when did it just become a little taste of the truth to you? How many of us are on the verge of selling out to something? We all face it. There, there's something. There, there's something. Maybe it's in the church. I remember we had a, a pastor friend at our last church. He became a, a missionary. I think it was called the Pearl Project. And he would go down to Mexico and he would do different things down there and come back and report. And I remember he came to our church once and he was telling how one of his church members 
after the service one week, he was walking out and, you know, people shake your hand. Good message, Pastor. Hey, that really spoke to me this morning. And the only thing this man had to say was, you wore that tie last week. <laughs> Pastor told us he wore that tie for two months straight. <laughs> he said, it's not about this. But that man got so offended because he wore that tie two weeks in a row. What is it? That person sat in my seat. You guys have heard me say that. We used to sit in the seats on purpose at our last church. I'll never forget somebody coming in, and me and my wife were sitting there two minutes before Sunday school, and this guy comes in and he looks at us, dumbfounded. Didn't understand what was happening in our church. He just looked at us. And I sat there awkwardly for a second, and my wife, I could tell she was getting uncomfortable. We weren't making eye contact. Don't look at him, it'll go away. Okay? And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I just look up at him, and he was just, it was almost like nothing was happening. And I said, yes, we're sitting here. He said, oh, 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 oh. And he was so confused. But little things like that, you'd be surprised. At, at our last church, there were visitors who would say, no, we're not coming back because somebody got mad at us because we sat in their seat. A visitor to church. I've heard tell of visitors in this church who probably will never come back because somebody got mad at them for sitting in their seat. Little things like that to where we're to the point, you know what? This is too convenient for me. My groove is in this pew. Hey, this is where I belong. And we have to be careful. We, we just have to be careful because our actions can really turn away other people from God. And the way that people look at us and the way that they try to get us to do things and they try to tell us, listen, it's okay to get away from those, those old ways of doing things. Listen, I'm not opposed to change as long as I don't shy away from the truth. I, I'm not opposed to mixing things up, but I'm staying true to the, the, the foundations. Listen, there, there are ways of, of reaching out to the youth today that are different from when I was a teenager. I had to make some changes. When I became a youth, I said, this isn't working. There are things you got to do a little bit differently on the buses now than you used to. We have to be careful, though, because somebody's going to say, bus ministry doesn't work anymore. How many times have you heard that one? Hey, it's not going to work. Why do you even run buses anymore, pastor? Hey, why do you guys even sing those hymns anymore, Ronnie? It makes no sense. Hey, why do you use that Bible anymore? Listen, this is still good, and it's easier to understand. This is still good, and it sounds a little bit more modern. Hey, this is still good. You know what? I'm not for sale. I, I, I've made that decision. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a Baptist on purpose. And it's not for sale. I was actually going to go over that tonight. But I felt like this was needed. I, listen, there are people in our church who are about to pull out, who are about to leave, who are about to change ways because it's not convenient for them. It's easier if I do it this way. Man, that just looks so much better over there. You know what? It's just not worth it. Don't be for sale. Put a stake in it. Be like that, that mighty man that David had in his employ. The, think of, I think his name was Shama. Think of the way he said, you know what? No, if I don't stick to this, I'm done. If I don't stick to this, my son, who knows what he could come become. Hey, if I don't teach these teenagers the truth, who knows what they're going to get? Because I, I know what they're hearing outside these walls. I'm not for sale. I'm not for sale. Miss Jennifer's going to start playing the piano. Think in your own life. Think of your own situations. Think of this church. Think of our community. 
And that verse rings out to me continuously in Ezekiel 22, 30. I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and take a stand in the gap before me for the land. Somebody to just stand up and say, I'm not budging. I'm not going to move. This is the truth. Thy word is truth. And trust it. And trust it. Stand with me tonight. Are you on the verge of selling out? Maybe it's not on church attendance. But maybe for the convenience of it, you say, you know what? I'd rather stay in bed and not read my Bible this morning. You know, there's no point in praying. I mean, I pray for my meals. That should be enough. You know, Sunday morning's enough at church. You know, it, it, one of the saddest things, I would say church vi visitation is one of the most talked about, but one of the least attended events in a church. Soul winning. The importance of seeing souls saved, and yet none of us hardly ever do it. We've sold out somewhere along the lines. Bow your head and close your eyes tonight. I, I want you to really consider it. I sold out once. I got out of church. I fell in with the wrong crowd. Some of you know from your own experiences. There's nothing better than what I'm doing right now. There's nothing better than serving God. 